Okay, in the interest of getting everyone home on time, I'm not going to cover uh, the practice normalization section. All the answers are on the web page and in the, the files you have with you. If you got stuck, you can look at those and you can compare it to the plots we've got on the website. And we're going to move on to dealing with confounders. Uh, and I'm going to briefly skip ahead here so that we can talk about experimental design. Because before we can figure out how to deal with confounders, it depends on what kind of experimental design you have. So this Tung data falls into this case with the replicates. So we have three individuals and we have three replicates for each individual. And we have batch effects between every different pair of uh, e each possible batch here. So we have batch effects within each individual and we also have batch effects between individuals. With batch effect correction methods, we can only correct for these batch effects within individuals and we can't correct for the batch effects between individuals because they're confounded with our biological factor of interest. If we had a balanced design, then we could have then all of the batch effects are just between these batches, not between our individuals, and we can correct for all of the batch effects using batch effect correction. Whereas if we have a completely confounded design where each biological condition is in a separate batch, and we have one batch for each condition, we can't do anything with respect to batch effect correction. So you need to know which case you're dealing with to know what exactly it is you're removing, and to know what sort of caveats you have to think about even after you've done batch effect correction. So with our replicates, after we've done batch effect correction, the differences we see between individuals are not necessarily just biological differences. There might still be batch effects between individuals that we just couldn't remove. So let me go back to dealing with confounders. Um, so we've, pr we've just corrected for uh, library size, effectively removing it as a confounder. Now we want to deal with batch effects that can re result from all kinds of different things, just uh, what individual was doing the experiment, what time of day you did the experiment, the specific uh, condition of the cells you're using or different reagents or whatever can cause slight differences in your technical factors that results in batch effects. And the key to being able to remove these batch effects is again experimental design. One approach to correcting for batch effects is to use spikens because they should be in theory the same across all of your batches. Um, in, prin in principle all the variable all the variability you see in the spikens between your different batches is due to batch effects, not due to technical noise. So then you could use those to train a model for the batch effects and then subtract that or remove it from the endogenous genes as well. And there are many methods uh, based on this premise. So there's uh, basics, SCLVM, and REVG. We're gonna look at REVG uh, because those other two methods take a lot longer to run but there's links for you to check them out. Um, they each use different, slightly different noise models and different fitting procedures, but conce conceptually they're doing the similar thing. Uh, we can also identify genes that are more variable than our technical spikens, because then we know those have at least some biological variability happening uh, to those genes. And there's again methods to do that, but we're not gonna deal with those uh, methods just now. However, there's been lots of concerns about whether spikens truly act as controls, and many people have seen that their spikin levels do correlate with their biological conditions, not just the technical factors. So they may or may not really be true controls that can be used for batch effect correction. Uh, however, other people have found the opposite and find that they are true control. So there's currently an argument as to whether we, they're actually useful for this uh, purpose or not. And in many cases, it's because we can assume most genes are not responding to the biology of in interest and we have a whole lot more endogenous genes 
then we do technological spikings. It may be more sensible and more practical to use endogenous genes instead of spikings. So these are all of the libraries we're going to be using in this section. And some code to load the data again, because we're going to be using tongue data. And if you didn't, and if you haven't normalized this using Scran, uh, you should do so to make sure you have the right data. So the first method we're going to consider is called remove unwanted variation. Um, so this basically uh, uses this model where this is our observed log expression is modeled as some unwanted uh, technical confounders plus our biological variability uh, plus the library size here. And then uh, our UV will fit a model to try and estimate this unwanted uh, matrix and then subtract that or remove that from the uh, observed expression. However, in order to be able to do this, you must uh, define the dimensions of W, uh, which is controlled by this parameter called K. You also have to specify some sort of control uh, groups for RUV to train this model on. So if you, RUVG uses negative controlled genes, i.e. your spikings, or if you have a list of housekeeping genes, you could use housekeeping genes as well. And it assumes that these genes have constant expression across all of your cells, and then uses that to fit the uh, matrix of unwanted variability that's affecting those genes. You, RUVS uses replicates present in your data, so uh, multiple batches that have the same uh, biology going on. So that it assumes that the biological factors, so if we go back uh, to here, it, it assumes that this is constant across all of the batches that you tell it and then uses that to fit uh, W. And then RUVR uses GLM regression, uh, but we're not going to talk about that method in this section. So this is how you run RUVG. So RUV uh, assumes you've given it counts, so we have to give it the raw count matrix. And then we specify which genes are the spikings, are the control genes. So we've chosen the ERCCs. And we have to specify the parameter K. And then we can also increase K to a higher level to remove more unwanted vari variation from our data. For RUVS, we have to specify uh, a matrix in which each row is a list of the column indices of cells belonging to the same biological condition. So here we're defining, uh, collecting those columns which are from the first individual, the second individual, the third individual, and here we're putting that into this matrix and filling up all the blank spaces with negative ones. Um, and here we specify that matrix when we're uh, building this model and specify K. And then we have to say that uh, is log is false because we're not giving it normal, uh, log normalized counts, we're giving it raw counts. And then we perform uh, library size normalization afterwards and log transformation because RUV will provide us with the corrected count matrix not the corrected log transformed matrix. So make sure all of our methods are the same. We're doing log uh, CPM normalized RUV corrected data. And we use two different Ks here. So we have a low K for remove a little bit of the unwanted variation and remove a lot. Another method is combat from the uh, SDA package, which was designed for bulk RNA-seq and I believe it was also used for microarray analysis. 
And it's basically a uh, Bayesian method based on linear models. So we have to specify, uh, so here we're going to grab the log count, so we use the normalized data for this because Combat does not explicitly model the library size itself, unlike RUV. And then we have to build a model uh, to tell Combat what we want it to remove and what not. So here we have to build a model for, to, to tell Combat what we don't want it to remove. So in this case, we use the um, individual batches, but because we've got, because individual is confounded with our batches, because we've got replicates, if you uh, tell uh, Combat to preserve the individual invariance by, while removing the, the batch variance, it will give you an error. So we can't do that. We can only use basic batch removal. And now it won't know about the biological uh, variance that we care about, so it will remove all of it, all of the variance, both the, the batch and the individual, because we have a confounded experiment. That's how you run it. And then we have the data. We have our vector of batches that we want it to remove, and then the model of what we want it to preserve. And some extra uh, parameters that aren't important. So we have an exercise here to perform combat yourself only now accounting for total features as a covariate uh, in the model. So replace this, this model with a model that accounts for total features. So I'll give you five minutes to do that. <coughs> 